Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture. As the name suggests, there's going to be both stargazing as well as a lecture tonight. Uh, so we'll start out with a 30-minute-ish public lecture on the topic of supernovae from massive stars, uh, which is going to be super interesting and exciting. And then following that, we'll have a bit of a choose-your-own-adventure where you can either stick around and hear and we'll have a Q&A panel consisting of our speaker, myself, and two other members of the department who work on different fields of astronomy and astrophysics to answer all of the questions that you may have uh, about space and astronomy and physics and whatnot. And we can't promise to know all the answers, but we'll do our best to respond in some capacity, maybe humorously. Um, but, uh, and at the same time as that, we'll have We'll have telescopes set up on the field just behind us. So to provide you with views of the sky, they're setting those up right now. It's a pretty clear night. It's pretty brisk. So hopefully I see some jackets in the audience. Good. Uh, but, but we should have some, some good views. Jupiter is high in the sky, which is always a, a treat. You can see, usually see Jupiter, see some of the banding of its atmospheric layers a, across the surface, as well as some of its moons, the Galilean moons that are orbiting around Jupiter. And at the same time as that, we'll have other deep sky objects that are visible in terms of the Orion Nebula, perhaps the Pleiades cluster. You may know Pleiades from the Subaru logo, the car logo, that's the Pleiades star cluster. Uh, so, so lots of good, good stuff to come up. Um, what are other announcements? Oh, first of all, I'm Cameron Hummels. I, I'm a research scientist here who organizes these events and I'll be your MC. And these events happen once a month on Friday nights. Our next one will be February, I think February 15th or 16th, just after Valentine's Day. And I thought I saw the speaker for next month in the audience. Uh, we're going to hear all about solar physics and preparing for the upcoming solar eclipse that's going to be visible from the United States, April 8th, Monday, April 8th. So that will be mid-February. We also have a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap. These events take place at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena, just a few miles away called the Dog House. It's an outdoor beer garden, and it might be a little brisk since it's still January, but uh, it's always a good time. Our speakers for that, it, that'll be Monday, January 29th, that our next one is, and our speakers will be talking about taking pictures of exoplanets, direct imaging of exoplanets with, with telescopes, as well as myths and legends of the night sky, not just from Western civilization, but also the speaker actually is a graduate student from India, so he's going to share some of the different cultural tales about some of the objects that we have in the sky from different cultures from around the world, which would be pretty, pretty intriguing. So I encourage you to check that out. Along with those, we also have astronomy-themed pub trivia and live music, and we also have a telescope there. So. Uh, feel inclined to come to those. Those are free. And I guess the only other announcement I have is we're helping again this year to help coordinate the Death Valley National Park Dark Sky Festival that will be taking place Friday through Sunday, March 1st to the 3rd this year. It's totally free. It's in Death Valley, which is about three and a half, four and a half hours from here, depending on how quickly you drive and how much uh, commuter traffic you catch. But uh, you can go out there, you can stay in the park, you can camp in the park, but there will be like 15 different public lectures given over the course of two, three days. There will be two astronomy on taps that take place in the park at the Badwater Saloon and at the Wild Rose Tavern in the park. And, and there will be all kinds of science demos and exhibits during the course of the day. So if you're, and of course there will be a star party because the night skies are really, really good there. So it's gonna be super cool. And, and uh, the last few have been really good. So, so get out there if you, if you are so inclined. And yeah, I think those are all of my announcements for right now. We're also live streaming on YouTube uh, to the camera just over here. So hello, YouTube audience. So if you missed something during the presentation tonight, you can always go online, look up Caltech Astronomy on YouTube, and you'll see the recording from tonight. And we have something like 100 different previous lectures that are on that YouTube channel of many different astronomical and science topics that, that previous lecturers have given over the course of the years. Okay, those are all my announcements. So our speaker for tonight uh, grew up outside of Chicago, did his undergrad in Indiana, and then did his PhD at Michigan State, where he finished just a couple of years ago, working on the very topic that we're going to hear about tonight, and that is 
stars undergoing collapse and then exploding or not exploding, as the case may be, uh, and how that can be observed, not just with our eyes and with, with electromagnetic waves that travel to us, but also with gravitational waves, potentially, that you may have heard about from like the LIGO discoveries that were done over the, over the last decade. Um, so since finishing his PhD at Michigan State, he traveled to here and has been a postdoc in the department for the last couple of years. And not only is he doing this research, but he also is known as a, as a science communicator. He's given a TED talk when he was in Michigan and is really accomplished on that front. So please welcome our speaker for tonight, Dr. Michael Pecos. Check one. Can everyone hear me in the back? Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Today, I'm going to be telling a story. We're going to be talking about the lives and the endings of massive stars. And so what we see behind me is the picture of a nebula left over from one of these explosions. We call it the crab. And this exploded hundreds of years ago. And what we're interested in learning is when we look up in space, when we see pictures from telescopes, things from Earth or things in outer space and beyond, we can see these tiny round objects, these brilliant bright pieces, almost like pieces of sparkling diamond that pepper the night sky. And if we look in different places, we also see remnants. We see much more spread out, diffuse things, things that have different structures, have different elements inside of them. And the question in the science that I'm interested in answering is how do we go from stars that we see to these beautiful remnants that we can see as well? Is there some piece of science, is there some piece of understanding we can glean to understand when a star goes from something before and whether or not it will blow up or if it just disappears and implodes? And that's what we're going to be investigating today. And so to direct what I'd like you all to look out for tonight, there's going to be four different points and you can focus on one, any or all of them. And those points are going to be what creates a supernova? that being the end of a massive star. What are some sorts of unique materials that we can get out of these things? What can we measure with our telescopes? What differentiates whether it explodes in something very bright or is a dud and falls in and forms something interesting called a black hole? And last but not least, what's left over when the supernova is over, whether it fails or not? We're gonna to touch on all of these different points. So we're going to begin with something familiar. Um, so we're going to begin with our home star, the sun. And if you haven't been exposed to what a star is, uh, it's basically a balancing act. So we have a lot of hot gas, and it starts to congregate. It starts to clump together in the shape of a ball, like we can see. Now, what makes this gas a star is that it starts to slam elements together. So in outer space, we have a lot of an element called hydrogen. And as that hydrogen starts to clump, it can start to heat up and it can start to crunch and it can get hotter and the pressure can go higher in the center. And so gravity is pulling this material in towards the middle. And fortunately for the star, there's something that's pushing outwards as well. See, the centers of stars are very hot. They're pushing back and resisting gravity. So throughout the course of a star's life, gravity's pulling in and pressure from these elements slamming together or fusing is starting to push outwards. Now for a sense of scale, our sun's pretty big. This very tiny white dot is the Earth to scale, and so it takes just over 100 Earths all the way across to fit the size of the sun uh, from end to end. And we want to learn about not just our sun, but we're interested in things much larger. And so like we talked about these stars, they're just, it's kind of like when you're on traffic, you know, maybe on the 210 or another freeway here in Los Angeles, things can bump together and things can stick together. And that's what these elements are doing. Hopefully you're not bumping into other people, but the other drivers are. And so the reason I'm interested in astronomy is because it draws a link between everyone in the room and everyone that you meet. What do you mean by that, Michael? So behind me, we're hearkening back to our chemistry classes in school. And I put some yellow boxes. And these are elements you find in stars, much in many stars, and in particular ones 10 times the mass, 10 times the weight of the sun. So we got hydrogen up there. That finds its way in from outer space. Hydrogen is important for water, if you enjoy drinking things. 
We have helium, if you've ever filled up balloons before for a party. You have things like carbon, if you like to barbecue, and we're also carbon-based life. Oxygen is pretty important for breathing. Neon, if you have your favorite signs at home. Uh, does anybody have a smartwatch or a phone in their pocket? You better believe you got silicon in your pocket right now. So that comes from massive stars, as well as iron, if you've ever, ever used things made of alloy, things like steel and construction and cars. And so these elements are generated, particularly the lower ones, in massive stars. We find things like hydrogen and helium already out in space. So all that to say, the material inside of us all came from a massive star, which is pretty cool. But I said massive star, so you might be saying, Michael, what do you mean by massive? I'm talking things 800 times the size of the sun. So now we have our sun down here, this little bitty guy. And this is an example of one called Betelgeuse. You may have seen a constellation up in space called Orion the Hunter. Orion's shoulder is very red. And the reason it's red is it's because from this star right here. Now, Betelgeuse is around 17 times the mass of the sun. So you take 17 suns and squash them all together, and you get something about this size at the end of its life. And what we're interested in doing is saying, what might happen to a star like Betelgeuse at the end of its life? So what we're doing is we're diving into where that circle is, and we're going to peel back the curtain, what's going on inside of a star anyways. And I alluded to elements fusing together, colliding, and creating new things that we can find. So we have things like hydrogen on the outside. We have things like helium, carbon, oxygen, neon, silicon, iron. These are making up the most of the star at the end of its life. So this element iron in the center is very interesting. Because if we zoom in and we take one out, we just pluck one out and we take a look at it, we could kind of see a cartoon representation. So all that stuff and matter we interact with here on Earth, it's made up of atoms. And what I mean by an atom is it has a nucleus, which is a protons and neutrons, and it also has electrons that are orbiting around it and kind of in a fuzzy haze as well. And so there's a bunch of these atoms stacked in the center of Betelgeuse right now. Now, interestingly enough, electrons are interesting particles, and a way you've interacted with electrons in an everyday setting. Um, it's winter, so you probably wear slippers at home. Has anybody ever touched a metal doorknob or someone else and you feel that shock? Okay, these are electrons shooting out of your finger and down into the earth. And so these are the atoms in your finger, the electrons going to somewhere, a different location. And the cool thing is, so we have all these electrons, and these are actually supporting the star. So it's kind of holding it up like scaffolding right now as gravity pulls it inwards. And when these electrons get close enough together, uh, they can start to, they can support things in certain cases. Now, as I alluded to, stars are hot, and we know that from the sun. We get sunburned, and you better believe something even larger could be hotter in the middle. And they're so hot that there's light in the center that actually destroys these atoms. It's starting to split them apart. This, the light will hit it, and it will crack. And now our scaffolding starts to break down. The pressure that was holding everything up, it fades away, and the core of the star, the center, collapses. This is the beginning of a supernova. This balance between gravity pulling in and pressure pushing out finally tips towards the inside of the star. So we zoom in into the center. We're now swimming in a bunch of silicon right now. It's really hot. And all that iron gets squashed together. All those atoms get clumped into a ball. Maybe you've heard of something called a neutron star. This is the beginnings of many neutron stars. To give you a sense of scale, um, has anybody driven to Laguna Beach before? Or Manhattan Beach, a little bit south? Okay. So a neutron star is about the drive, and there's no traffic. Well, I mean, there might be traffic in neutron stars. There's no cars, but it's about 60 miles. So I did some Google Mapsing, and I found maybe I can go on a weekend trip, and this is about the size of what a neutron star is. So it's this big lump of neutrons and other particles sitting in the center. 
So it's very dense, it's very heavy. Now all the while we have something very sturdy, very dense, a neutron star, and all that stuff is collapsing like we talked about before. Now these neutrons, they can act as scaffolding, they can hold things and support things too. And so all that stuff falling in immediately gets halted and starts to fly to the outer parts of the star. This is like, once again, if you're in a traffic jam, all the cars are going one way, and when one of them has to stop, all of the other cars have to stop towards the outside part of the star. So we're not dealing with cars, we're dealing with plasma or gas, um, but the principle is the same. There's a very hot, dense wall of material, and it's working its way towards the outer part of the star. Now, other ways or other places you may have heard of a shockwave before. Um, when jets fly supersonically, faster than the speed of sound, they also form a shock front. They're actually pushing a wall of air and moisture with them, and you can actually see these, uh, these vapor cones because they're moving so quick. So you can kind of think of that, you know, we have a lot of this material that's moving outwards. That's the takeaway from this. Okay, I want to pause for a moment, just review. So we've talked about stars, massive ones, 10 times the mass of the sun. Gravity is trying to turn them into a tiny ball and crunch them together. And fortunately, there are atoms that are fusing and trying to push them out. And the supernova is when the support in the center breaks down and everything falls in. That's where we're at. And so I've showed you cartoons before, but I think it's important to kind of peel back the curtain and what are, what are we looking at in terms of a day-to-day -day research agenda or a research campaign uh, when we're investigating supernovae. And so what we're looking at is actual scientific data. This is from a simulation modeling these supernovae. And so we've dove in, we, you know, we're in the center of the star right now. From end to end is around 100 miles or so. So we're looking at that central thing we called a neutron star. And what we're going to watch is the evolution, the dynamics and how the fluid behaves. The brighter a color that you see, the faster the fluid is. And if you're photosensitive, uh, you are gonna wanna look away for the next 20 seconds and then I'll bring you back to it um, because there are some bright lights. And so you notice to start, uh, we kind of see something like scrambled eggs spinning in a blender. And so, Mike, what's actually going on? Uh, this is the star, this is a supernova that's spinning. And so all stars rotate to some degree. And as time evolves, we can start to see some structure start to form. This is the center, this is the new neutron star. And as time starts to go on, we see some more structure. We see a lot of violent motion with the fluid as this thing starts to rotate. Now, the interesting thing about astronomy is that science is really at its most extreme. I've slowed down this video. In reality, we expect from these results all of this to occur within half a second. So we've slowed it down so we can appreciate it rather than just watching the last frame and hoping we don't blink. And so the takeaway from this, this is actual scientific data from a collaborator, Quo Chen and myself, is there's a lot of fluid moving around and things are pretty chaotic and shaking around inside the center of a dying star. So that brings us to our first way we can start to tell what's really going on inside of a star. And so there are signals called gravitational waves. And so there's a lot of research here at Caltech that goes into these things. If you haven't learned about these before, these are ripples of gravity, things in the space and time that we live. And the way I like to think about them is, uh, when we look in space at night, maybe you go and you look at the telescopes outside, you're measuring and seeing something with your eyes or with a detector or with a camera. And that's because we're collecting light in these telescopes. Gravitational waves are a little bit different. 
instead of seeing something with our eyes, this is quite literally something you would feel. This is actual space changing distances. So if one were to pass through here, the distance between the end and this end, or from my left ear to my right ear, that would change. Fortunately, they're weak enough to where you don't see my head doing that, but this gives you, it lets you keep a pulse on things in astronomy. And what my research has been over the past five or six years is given these events, given this shaking around inside of a supernova, what can we learn from the gravitational waves? And this is unique because one, because they're rippling out, we can get information about the center of the object because these pass through material. So if we get some information from the center, it will pass through the rest of the supernova and we can collect it with a detector. Why is this important? Well, if I was to look at this with the telescope, we had all that stuff in the way. We had all those layers of the star that we couldn't peer through with a regular telescope. So this lets us look at a different part of the dying star. And I like to think of these as kind of like instruments. Uh, does anybody, does anyone play an instrument or sing or anything like that? I wish I could, but you know, my sister wouldn't want to hear me do that. So uh, why did I say these are like instruments? Because based on the wave that you see, this tells you about the source. So if you were sitting in a pool and um, I used to have a little schnauzer poodle dog, Gracie, if Gracie jumped in the pool, I would get a little wave and I would say, okay, I felt a little wave. This must be something small making it. Uh, now, by contrast, if one of my buddies jumped in uh, from the volleyball team, I would get a much larger wave than little Gracie. And I would be able to tell, oh, this must be a much larger source. And so we can do the same game with gravitational waves. If you have a smaller tuning fork and you hit it, it would ring at a higher frequency. If you had a very long tuning fork, it would emit at a very low frequency. And so based on the size, of the object in the center, that will affect the kind of wave that we can measure. Now, in terms of what we can, you know, how we actually detect these things, this is a gravitational wave observatory. So it's not like a telescope you may see out in the back. Um, this is the one in Livingston, Louisiana. And so it kind of looks like two concrete tubes going from end to end. And those are just to protect the instruments inside. Um, but it's basically a laser pointer it goes in two different ways. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, this is uh, one of the technicians who are assembling the telescope. And it lets you detect these very sensitive waves that are being created from different things. The next thing I'm going to talk about is something called a neutrino. And the interesting thing about these is that they're the leftovers from the star before. And so earlier on, we said there was a lot of atoms floating around in the center of the star, like Betelgeuse. And I talked about them all getting squashed. They all got crunched together. And if we have a lot of stuff in the center of a star and it gets crunched, all that stuff needs to go somewhere. It needs to turn into something. And so if we have atoms, like protons and neutrons, and you crunch all the electrons together, you get neutrons and you get neutrinos. So you can kind of imagine these neutrinos spraying out, getting out of that central object. And these hold a different kind of information that are equally as interesting. They tell us a new part about how the supernova is evolving. Because Similar to gravitational waves, neutrinos are mostly transparent to matter. They don't interact with a lot of things. Every so often they might, but they also give us information about the center of the dying star. And the way I like to think about neutrinos, these are like thermometers for the star. Because wherever they get emitted, they hold information about how hot it is around them. So if they get emitted in the center, that's like getting a 
kind of like putting your thermometer in the Thanksgiving turkey, but it's all the way in the center of a massive star. And so that tells you something about the local temperature, which is something we could not see with our light as well. Now, if you want to go to an observatory that looks for neutrinos, I would say these look even uh, This is an example of Super Kamiokande. This is in the Kamioka Mountains in, on the island of Japan. And this is sensitive to certain kinds of neutrinos. And the other one is called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or DUNE for short. And this, <laughs> if you've read the book, I think they came out with a TV series too. Um, this is a telescope. And there's a detector in Fermilab, which is in the state of Illinois, and it's, in, it's underground. And they shoot a bunch of particles towards a mine in South Dakota, and that's where their detector is. And so it's kind of a cross-state thing. But because neutrinos pass through matter, they don't need to dig a tunnel. They can just let them fly on through, and hopefully a few of them interact with their detector. So we're going to look at some more simulation output. And this is, from, uh, this is from a different star than we saw before, a different supernova. And from end to end, this is once again around 100 miles. And this green line, this is the surface of the neutron star, that new ball in the center of the supernova. And what you're going to see is bright colors. So we have the neutron star. We have all the material around it. And remember that shock, that dense wall. We're going to see what it actually does. As the time evolves, we see the shock moving towards the outside part of the star. And all the while, we're actually getting a live feed, a live signal of the gravitational waves, those ripples that we might expect to have. We see a lot of fluid churning. It's starting to stir things around. And that's because those little neutrinos, one in every, ma one in every many, is actually causing this, the fluid to stir and bubble. And so that's what's actually pushing the shock to the outside part of the star. So what did we review in this last part? We were in the center of a supernova, a star that was falling in and now racing out. We're getting ripples that tell us about the object in the center called gravitational waves. And we're also getting neutrinos, these tiny little particles that we'd like to measure that tell us about the temperature. So these are two examples of measurements we can make, of unique things we can pick up with our detectors. But we, like we alluded to in the beginning of the talk, we also get elements. And I would say some unique ones at that. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in just outside of the neutron star, where some of that material is being flung out from those neutrinos. And so we're going to walk step by step into how these unique elements are made. So here we have a bit of a cartoon. Here on the bottom in the blue, we have a neutron. So this is a piece of those things called atoms we talked about. And up here, we have some neutrons and some protons clumped together. And so in the center of the star, things are very chaotic, things are very crowded, and things can actually collide on the very small scale. So maybe after step one, step two, you've got three neutrons and two protons together. So you've got a new element, something new, something unique compared to before. Now, one of two things is probably going to happen. If we look at the first one, we've got some, we've got five circles together, five nucleons, if you want to call them that. And to be more relaxed, to be more stable, this atom will actually spit out an electron. It'll get rid of it and it'll be in a more stable state, one that nature prefers. If you wait long enough, you'll get the slow route on the top. But something else can happen. If you don't wait long enough, if you have a little bit of time, you can have this atom with five nucleons, and you can hit it with another one, and you can hit it with another one, and you can hit it with another one. So if things are moving rapidly enough, 
you can actually make bigger and bigger elements that you wouldn't normally do before. And so we're going to do a little live demonstration. Cameron, if you want to join me up here. So we're going to enact first this slow process. We'll just call it an S process. And so Cameron, Cameron is going to be the neutrons. He's going to be these blue things. And he's wearing blue on his shirt. We didn't even plan that. And we're going to do the S process first. OK, now remember, I'm, I'm the atom, so I'm here. OK, so Cameron, let's do the slow process. So he's going to throw a neutron at me. OK, so I'm the atom, and I caught it. And remember, if we're doing the slow one, what do I have to do with this electron? I've got to get rid of it. So we got rid of the electron, and I keep the proton. So remember, now i got this extra proton. So we're going to wait a little bit, and then we're going to do one more, because it's slow. OK, perfect. And so I've got to get rid of the electron again, and I'm going to put it here. So now I'm a new atom. I had all the stuff that I had before. I had my jacket. And I wanted this to stick to me. I have my shoes, and now I have these, I have these two things sticking to me. So now I'm a, new, I'm a new element. OK, so now we need to do the rapid, we need to do the R process. So I'm in a, <laughs> I'm an atom again. And remember, we need this, we need a few more neutrons than before. Because we're making a new element. And remember, my goal is the atom. I need to get rid of the electrons. OK, I'm ready. <laughs> OK, I got one. <laughs> so you understand how this is starting to change. Because if things are rapid enough, I don't have time to get rid of the electrons. <laughs> so things start to pick up around me. And I think I could probably hold the last one. Um, Cameron, thank you. Everyone give Cameron a round of applause. So as you can see, I have a lot more neutrons now than I did before, and I did not have enough time to get rid of them as electrons. This is what we call the rapid process or the R process. And so I'll sweep these up later, and I'll try not to trip over them. So this is how unique elements can be made. And so we're going to go back to our slides here. And so you may be asking, Michael, you've talked about these elements. What kind of elements are you talking about? So there's different forms of the R process. It can be strong or weak. Uh, in supernovae, active research su suggests we may be able to get weak R process elements, like we can see here. Um, if you're balling on a budget and you want to buy some jewelry, you can get zirconium, which is like a, you know, it's a substitute for a diamond. Just don't tell whoever you're getting it. Uh, if you're a gearhead and you like to work on cars, uh, catalytic converters have palladium in them. They're very good at cleaning the exhaust that comes out of the car. And if you are not balling on a budget and you get jewelry, you could get something like silver. And so these are examples of elements that are made from this weak R process. Now it's important to note, this happens in a lot of other places too. Namely, when you collide those two neutron stars together, that I alluded to a little bit earlier, when they merge, you can get other things like gold and even more exotic elements. Um, but there are still studies ongoing suggesting we think supernovae uh, may be a site where we can find these things. But supernovae also generate other unique things. Not necessarily with the R process. During the later parts of the supernova, you can generate things like aluminum for your favorite can of soda. You can get calcium if you enjoy dairy products or other things, and potassium. So there are a variety of processes. We can go over these later, but supernovae generate elements for other things that you may interact with in your day-to-day -day life. So the question stands, how do we get from those videos that you explained to something like we can see here in Cassiopeia A, the remnant from one of these explosions. We have these elements. We have this wall of material that's racing to the outer part of the star. How do we get over there? And so we're going to go over what inside the star influences what occurs outside the star. 
So we have a cartoon here. And if you see something dark, a darker shade, it is material that's dense. If you see something that's much lighter, we're going to call this fluffy material. It's a lot more spread out, kind of like a cloud. It's a little bit more diffuse. And some stars, they have, a lot, they have elements in them. All of them do. Some of them have a transition that goes very smoothly from something very dense to something fluffy. And in the supernova, like we talked about, there's this shock wave. It's trying to get to the outside part. And the thing is, if you have a smooth transition from dense to fluffy, this makes it harder for the shock to escape. This makes it harder for the star to explode. And so it ends up going with the shock is trapped. It's, it's harder for it to get to the outside part of the star. You may be asking, Michael, what do you get when you're done with that? You may get something called a black hole. If you've seen Interstellar or other uh, science, you know, science movies, you bring up these concepts of objects really dense, the densest we can get, and they don't let light escape. And that's why they're black. And this is from a numerical relativity simulation from my research group here at Caltech. And this gives you a sense of what it looks like behind the black hole comes and goes to your camera or wherever you're viewing from. But the more interesting ones, the more interesting cases for supernovae are the ones that blow up. And so what helps a star blow up? Well, we have our dense material again. Except in this case, there's a very sharp, distinct jump from something that's very dense to something that's very fluffy. And as this dense wall falls and collapses, like the name suggests, the shock has a much easier time breaking out, racing towards the outside part of the star and giving us a brilliant, bright light show that hopefully we can pick up with our telescopes. What do we get when we're done with this? Well, we get some interesting findings from current research. So this is from Adam Burroughs and company, these simulations. Uh, and we notice that they're not perfect spheres. So the outer part of the star can start to make these different lobes, these different shapes. And what's left over at the center of this object is something called a neutron star. That initial object that starts to cool off. It's a very hot rock made of a lot of those neutrons that we referred to earlier. And in rare cases, this is from findings just from this year, you can actually, you can actually form a black hole and explode the star. This is a very rare case. Um, most of the ones that don't explode, you'll get a neutron star, but in some cases, you can have something blow up and get a black hole. So just as a slight review, if you have a smooth transition, from dense stuff to fluffy stuff, the shock will get trapped, or it'll, it will tend to get trapped, and it will form a black hole. If you have a sharp change from material that's dense to material that's fluffy, that helps the star blow up. It makes it a little bit easier, too. So I want to leave you with a, another simulation from my collaborator, Kuo Chen. And this is an example of a star going supernova as well. We get a more of a full picture. We start to see that fluid mix around. It starts to churn. It starts to bubble. Those neutrinos we talked about are causing it to start to push and grow to larger scales. And so here in a second, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom out, and that's going to help us get a fuller perspective. All the while remembering this is happening in under half a second. And so by slowing it down, we can start to see the different details. Those unique elements that we talked about, those are being stirred up, and we're getting a pretty cool light show all the while. And so hopefully we want these stars to blow up to see something interesting. Uh, but like we learned, not all of them are going to. Some will collapse, and they will form those objects like black holes.
And the beautiful part about supernovae is that they're all unique. We can predict some qualities, we can predict some things that we can measure, but all the while, they, in a way, all have their own fingerprint. They'll form their own shape, they'll have their own outcome, and they'll generate different amount of elements as well. So we're gonna end where we began. What did we go over today? We talked about things that drive supernovae. We alluded to different materials we can make that you may go on a, with a grocery trip or under your car. We talked about things, whether they explode or not, as well as the remnants. I'm a visual learner, so it always helps me to kind of look at the pictures that I saw throughout the story. So we saw some central parts of a supernova, and those neutrinos were flying off, and they were making those ripples called gravitational waves. We learned about different elements we can see, things like zirconium, uh, potassium for bananas. And we learned that if there's a sharp change between something dense and something fluffy, this can help a star exploding. And all the while remembering there's going to be objects left over, like neutron stars or black holes, and hopefully some unique elements too that you may have made with the R process. Thank you. So we can take, we'll take um, a few questions just right now with Michael before we get started and do the switch to the telescopes and the Q&A panel. So are there any, any questions for, for Michael? And I'll, before you just start shouting things out, I'll pass you the mic so our online audience can hear the questions as well. Hi. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so why do some stars have a transition that's very smooth from dense to fluffy, whereas others do not? Like, what's the reason? Sure. Why do stars, why are some of them having this very sharp transition, whereas other ones are more gradual or smoother from that dense to that fluffy? And we're still figuring that out right now. So if you want to join us with the Stellar Evolution community, um, but in, in all seriousness, so when a star goes throughout its life, I talked about it fusing these elements. Um, we saw that picture uh, earlier in the talk of uh, Betelgeuse, and so uh, it's going to get bright. So put on your sunglasses. So we have these different we have these different layers, and I've drastically oversimplified it. And so what's interesting is once you know at the beginning of a star's life, you know, say with the early sun, um, there was a little bit of helium, but it was mostly made of hydrogen. And it eventually got so hot that the hydrogen ignited, turned on, and it got really hot. And so if it gets really hot and leaves a lot of energy, well, the star, it kind of gets pushed out a little bit, and then it kind of settles down. And every time we ignite another layer of these elements fusing together, that's going to disturb the star and cause it to slosh around. And so it's very sensitive to how much mass that it began with. So for example, there was a study done a few years ago. Uh, there was a star that was 14.99 suns put together. And there was a study that did 15.01 stars put together, drastically different. One blew up, one didn't. And so there's an incredible sensitivity between how these layers push and pull on each other and the final structure of the star, whether there's a very steep, transition between silicon and oxygen or whether it's a little bit more gradual so and we're still figuring out the finer details yeah thank you so much for the talk uh, i'm curious about one thing that you mentioned before you mentioned that the gravitational waves that LIGO could detect tells us something about the center of the star but doesn't doesn't it also carry information about the outer layer of the star and if so how do we separate the two pieces or is one of them like much more um like leaves a much stronger imprint on gravitational wave versus the other thank you yeah so how do we pull apart these signals from uh the center of the supernova versus the outer parts and so you're absolutely right so we're going to watch this again because i spent a lot of time making it and uh so there's two things going on one is we see all this material sloshing around, which is the outer part that you alluded to. And so this material is moving relatively slow. All the while, this neutron star is getting slammed. 
it's getting pushed with all of this material that's swirling around and it's causing it to shake and it's causing it to vibrate. And so the frequency of the waves or how fast that wave goes up and down is a lot shorter for this compared to these slow churning objects. And so um, if you've ever passed something for, through a prism before, um, so like uh, if you're a classic rock fan, Pink Floyd had an album, it's called The Dark Side of the Moon. And it's a piece of, and if you're at home, I'm drawing a prism, Google Dark Side of the Moon, and it'll come up. And you can pass light through a prism and it will split into colors or frequencies. And so we can do this creatively using math uh, to split gravitational waves into frequencies as well. And so by measuring the low frequency, slower moving material, we get, in it, we get a measurement of this material. And by looking at the very fast oscillating waves, we get a detection on this. Take. Okay, we'll take one more question. Don't worry. I know there are still lots of questions in the audience. We'll get to them, but we'll do it during the Q&A panel. I don't want to hold up people. I know people are anxious to get out and check out the telescopes. Why do constellations never change, such as the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Orion? Wonderful. Why do constellations never change? So a constellation is a grouping of stars, and uh, the there's a group of astronomers on Earth, the International Astronomical Union. Um, they've got a, a, a certain set ones that we can look at, but depending on the culture that looks up into the night sky for you know as long as humans have been alive, we've seen these different structures. And these are so incredibly far away that even though the Earth spins and moves around the sun, they're so far away they appear as unchanging. Now, the interesting thing about astronomy is that it takes certain things can go really quickly, like we saw with the supernova. Other ones last incredibly long. So certain stars, you know, like the ones we looked at with these massive ones, these can last tens of millions of years. For us, is really long. If you look at lower mass stars, these can last for billions of years. And so, because the life of these stars is so much longer than us, you know, for the fraction of a, you know, the time that we've been here on Earth as humans, they appear as unchanging. So they last a lot longer than we do. Okay. Let's, let's thank our speaker for the big round of applause. Excellent work. Um, okay, so, so now we will transition. We're going to have our Q&A panel in here for the next hour. And we're going to have telescopes. They're already set up on the field behind us. And feel free to go back and forth between the two. If everyone runs out to see the telescopes, then there's going to be big lines because 120 people are going to be lined up to see the telescopes. And you're going to get cold. So maybe some people stay in here and then in a few minutes go outside. Or the people who go outside right away come back in a few minutes. But both events will be going on until about 9.45 or so. Um, so uh, those of you who chose to stick in here, we're going to get a set up for the Q&A panel. We'll get started in like five minutes. Um, and if you, if you guys head out or whatever, our next one of these is January or February 15th or the 16th um, on, the, on solar physics, what's going on in our sun and what we can learn about our sun, as well as the upcoming solar eclipse on April 8th. So, okay, break. We'll be back in like five minutes.
All right. Thanks for sticking around, everybody, uh, for our Q&A panel. Um, we'll just, so there are the four of us, I'll just have us each go through and give a short introduction to who we are and what we work on, and then we'll let loose and you guys can ask questions. We also have some questions from our YouTube audience in case you guys are like, oh, I don't have any more questions. They've solved all of, all of the universe's qu uh, problems, um, and then we'll dig into some of the internet's problems. And, uh, and we'll just go from there. So I'm, uh, I'm Cameron Hummels. I am a research scientist here. My research primarily is confined to working on galaxies like our Milky Way and how they change and form over really, really long timescales. I primarily do this using computer simulations where we try and model how these things change on, because if you just st st look and stare at a galaxy for a few days or years, it's not going to change very much because it takes a really long time for them to change. But on a computer simulation, we can artificially speed up that time so we can see how it changes over a million or a billion years, which is useful if you want to see how it's changing. Um, and I worry about, yeah, uh, galactic atmospheres and then cosmology, like larger scale stuff. So I can try and address those questions. Pass it on. Okay, you've heard me talk for you know half an hour. Uh, I'm Michael Pecos. I looked at supernovae, so dying stars. Uh, many moons ago, I also did work on uh, globular clusters, which are really old clumps of stars together with some things like black holes spinning in them too. Uh, and I also used to be uh, an observational astronomer, so I looked at stars that pulsate, um, and I've done some work with observatories too. Yeah, so my name's Delina Dunn, or D. Um, I'm a grad student here at Caltech. Um, and what I study is also galaxies, kind of like Cameron, um, but unlike Cameron, I study them observationally. So I work with a telescope that's actually located in the Owens Valley, about three hours north of here. Um, and what we are doing is we are scanning a really big region of the sky, and we are trying to map out the fuel that makes stars. So there's a specific type of hydrogen gas that stars are formed from. And we're trying to map out where that is in the universe. Um, mostly we're looking very far away and also kind of back in time about uh, 10 billion years ago. Hi, hi everyone. My name is, uh, what's my name? Again? Oh yeah, Nicholas. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm a grad student in, uh, in this department. I study theoretical astrophysics. And in particular, I'm interested in star quakes, uh, how we can measure them, how they work, um, and what we can learn by measuring them in terms of what kinds of magnetic fields they might have or uh, what kinds of interesting things might have happened to them in the past, like stellar mergers. Okay. This is still on. Okay. So for those of you who had questions that didn't get answered during the brief Q and A that we had, do you still have those questions? Questions here, we'll go. Don't worry, we'll get to everybody, I promise. So, so you mentioned in the presentation that like neutron, neutron stars um, within the star, they usually form around 60 kilometers. Uh, so black holes that form, did they have, did they form a, with a similar Schwarzschild radius? If they collapse into one. Okay, so the question is, neutron stars, which tend to be on the order of tens of kilometers in size, is the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of comparable mass a similar scale or is it bigger or smaller it seems like it should be smaller the short shield radii are usually really tiny right yeah dude i don't work on black holes you guys talk about you work on stars and black holes so it's it is smaller but it's not actually smaller by that much and the way to think about it is that um neutron stars are objects where the you know einstein's theory of general relativity matters a lot and that's because they're compact enough that they're kind of like similar to the size of a short shield radius. So there may be like, I, I forget exactly, maybe a factor of two bigger or something like that, but not much bigger, but bigger. They're not black holes. Okay. And I also wanted to add, so that's when the neutron star first forms. So it's really stinking hot. And it, you know, the neutron stars that we see out in space where they're not in the center of a star anymore, they have a lot of time to cool down so those little neutrinos, those fly out, and it'll actually shrink, it'll actually cool down. And so, uh, although it forms around, you know, 50 or 60 kilometers, it's going to finally condense, you know, closer, you know, between 10 and 20. So it just, it needs more time to cool off. It's just when it first forms, it's around, you know, 60 or so. 
Okay, who's up next? I'm just gonna work my way back here. Yeah. Love the lecture and thank you for everyone who, who came out. My question is on gravitational waves. Uh, how big would a gravitational wave have to be or how close would a supernova have to occur in, in order for us to uh, physically feel, that, feel those waves coming through? Just curious about that. Physically feeling the gravitational waves. I, I mean, that's not my area, but I think it'd have to be pretty darn close to feel the stretching, the pulling, and the, and the strain that you'd feel. Because, correct me if I'm, if, if I'm wrong, but with LIGO making the detections of the binary black hole mergers, I thought that the, the, the measurement of the strain, like how much space is actually being stretched and compressed, over a, over a five kilometer, you know, a three mile length of that baseline of the LIGO detector was on the order of the size of a proton. So you can imagine like, you're not gonna feel like, oh, I got stretched out a little proton radius and then I got compressed a little proton radius. It's gonna take a lot more intensity of those gravitational waves, which I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not bad that we can't feel these things because it, it goes from being like, oh, that's a little tickle to, oh, my whole body's stretched apart. So you don't want that to be so close that it risks like destroying all matter on Earth. But um, I don't know. I think, I mean, we could, I don't work on this, so I can just talk. But, um, but, I don't, I don't think that there would be, I don't think a supernova at any, like, we have bigger fish to fry if a nearby supernova goes off, then does it do a gravitational wave that we can feel, because we'll get like a gamma ray burst that happens in our face. So, yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's a worry. I don't think we could feel, I You want to talk about, this is your research. <laughs> well, I mean, I, <laughs> so, if you, um, you know, if it, the, the gravitational waves I was talking about, uh, as you get further from something, they get weaker. And so like you suggested, you know, how close do we have to get? And so, you know, as you go away from the source, if you move, you know, if you're standing one, say you're, you know, say you're standing one unit of distance away, one mile away, and then you move to two miles away, the gravitational wave will be twice as weak. If you move four miles away, it will be four times as weak. And this is different than light. Light behaves differently. If you move, you know, four times as far away, it gets 16 times as dim. So the gravitational waves are a little bit different. Um, I think Cameron brings up an interesting point that if you are close enough to feel the gravitational wave, then you have to start worrying about the supernova itself. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a number off the top of my head, you know, besides me scribbling some figures on the board. Um, but I don't think you'd have to be close, you know, if you move close enough, then you'd have other things to worry about. If you want, we can scribble some math after the Q&A if you want. I'm happy to do that, but okay, yeah. <laughs> any other things to add before we move on to any? Okay. It's always fun to talk about like disasters from physics, like the end of the world, as long as it's not going to happen. Um, okay, I'll, I'll work my way back in the audience here. Thank you. Um, okay, is this working? It's on. It's on. Okay. Okay. Um, I kind of wanted to check for my understanding of this. The supernova la lasts like a, an instant. Is that what you were saying? Like the explosion? Or when you snapped? Yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure. Yeah. So how long does the supernova last? Yeah. Um, it, there are different phases. So to go from... Um, you know, to go from beetle, oh, these are some good markers. Um, if you go from Betelgeuse to, you know, or that big core made of iron falling in on itself. So uh, there are people online, I'm drawing a circle, and the circle is around, let's say, a thousand kilometers. Um, so you're talking, you know, hundreds of miles. Um, to go from the iron core down to the little new neutron star, that happens in a fraction of a second. So that's very fast. I also talked about, we also saw that like scrambled eggs video with all the stuff stern around and all the churning. Uh, that happens in less than a second. Now, 
in the beginning of the talk, we dove into the center of the star. For that shock, that dense wall, to get to the outside part of the star, which is you know well beyond the board, that happens on the order of hours to days. And so even though there's things that are fast happening, if you were just looking at the star, you wouldn't see anything on the outside until days later. And so the interesting thing is, we can get measurements of gravitational waves and neutrinos, and it can say, hey, you're an astronomer, you just detected a gravitational wave, we're gonna expect a star to blow up in a few hours, you know, in hours today. So it can actually be a warning sign. And so people with these places like LIGO, or Super Kamiokande act as warning, uh, you know, warning sirens for people with other telescopes to say, start looking, you know, we got a detection and we need to, you know, we need to start looking for it. So to answer your question, things happen in less than a second, but to actually blow up the star, this is hours to days. Oh, this, this lasts for, you know, thousands of years longer, you know, you know, rem these remnants, it depends what you look at them with. Maybe do you want to talk about observations with other He's not an observer. Okay. But we can talk about Let's it. talk about other, how, how long can you see something? You know, do you just use light with your eyes or can you look longer for think of it? Things? Think of it like a firework. You know, we just had New Year's. People were blowing off all kinds of fireworks in the sky. Initially, like how long does it take for a firework to go off and how, how long is that firework visible? So it'll go off. And of course, that ignition, that occurs in a, in a, in a, in a moment, in a glimpse. But it continues to expand and as it does, it's, it's cooling off and it's getting dimmer and eventually it fades. But if you had a sufficiently powerful telescope, you'd continue to see it for longer than your eyes do because it's just getting cooler and it's less, less luminous. It's the same thing with, with anything really, but with supernovae that are essentially just big fireworks, stellar fireworks, that isn't in your title, is it? Stellar fireworks. A missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, uh, the explosion occurs and it just, it's fading and it's expanding and it's cooling, but it's, it's just getting dimmer over time. There are supernovae that people observed in the sky a thousand years ago. There's records from the people who were living at the time, like, holy cow, what the, he what the heck was that? That were visible during the daytime because they were so luminous, you know, as bright as the full moon, something like that. And we can still see those in the sky when we, if you know where to look. So for instance, one of the objects in the night sky, it's called the Crab Nebula, um, is the remnant of a supernova that blew up in 1054 and was visible during the daytime during 1054 for a few weeks. Um, now you can't see it with your naked eye, but if you have a telescope and you know where to look, you'll see this expanding shell of material um, and we'll continue to be able to see this into the, into the future. It'll just get fa fainter with time. And so you'll need increasingly more powerful telescopes to see it. Yeah. I'd like to say another thing, which is that, um, so, okay, so as uh, Michael was saying, um, it's very hard to catch the beginning of a supernova uh, if you don't know that it's going to happen. And so most of the supernovae that we know about, we don't actually like measure the very beginning of. Um, but it's kind of interesting, like uh, one of the things I find really interesting about astrophysics is that, you know, it's it's on this really grand scale, all of this stuff, right? Big balls of gas and like big clouds and stuff. Um, but somehow a lot of what we observe in astrophysics, a lot of how things like stars or supernovae happen depend on like sort of very subtle facts about like nuclear physics. And so one of these subtle facts is that uh, the reason why, uh, you know, one of the big contributions to like the the brightness of a supernovae like days after it happens turns out to be this random isotope of nickel that just is radioactive and decays over that period of time so i think that's kind of interesting you know we have this intuition that explosions they're kind of like hot and they cool down but there's some radioactivity and some other subtle stuff going on that contributes to the shape of the the uh the brightness over time and uh teaches us about the physics that's going on cool okay Okay, <laughs> working our way, working our way back. You said that you get gravitational waves, they, they're sensed. Is there any way to um, uh, have any idea where they're coming from? Um, is there any instruments that are telling you the direction or what part of the sky that you should be looking at? Or it's just popcorn, needle in a haystack? Yeah, so we get a gravitational wave and how do we know where to look? And this is, 
you know, this is a, a problem that scientists have been thinking about for a while. And the kind of what it comes down to is the more you have, the better. And so right now we have, there are two LIGO detectors. One is in Livingston, Louisiana. One is in Hanford in Washington state. And you can think of them like L shapes, because I said they were, they were those two laser pointers. And they're kind of tilted from one another, and that's on purpose. Because if you have these things misaligned, some regions are going to be, you know, they're going to have a sweet spot. They're going to be sensitive. And some, they're going to have a blind spot. So, you know, if you were looking with binoculars, your sweet spot's right in front of you. And as you get towards your peripherals, it's a little bit harder. And so these, measure, these detectors also have sweet spots and they have blind spots. And the idea is, if we have a few of these, you know, if Cameron has one and Dee has one and Nicholas has, Nicholas has one, you know, we're all tilted to different ways. Cameron's going to cover my back, Dee's going to cover my back, and Nicholas is going to have my back. And hopefully, if we have enough of them, we can all, you know, catch points of the sky. So we have, we have two in the United States. We have one called Virgo that's in Europe. Um, we have one called Kagra, which is in Japan, near that neutrino detector. And I think there's one called Geo 600. It's like a small one, too. Um, so we have, you know, we have a handful of these things. And so the idea is you use all of them at the same time to narrow down the region on the sky. And so something interesting is when um, you get gravitational waves from other things. And most of what we see is from two objects spinning together and colliding. And one that we saw, this was uh, seven years ago. Was the, was the merger in 2017? 2017. It was just before the eclipse. Yeah, so we had two of these neutron stars coming together. Um, it actually happened in the blind spot of the detector in Europe. And the fact that it happened in the blind spot told astronomers where to look. If it was in its sweet spot, the region of the sky would have been a lot bigger. So, you know, scientists who oriented these things, they put a lot of work into it, and it ended up paying off. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm still getting to everyone, I promise. Um, okay. Talking to it. Okay, so you said that um, when when the core turns into like a neutron star, um, all the atoms broke break apart. But when something's plasma, it's uh, basically a bunch of nuclei, nuclei, nuclei and electrons falling apart so isn't it already broken up sure. okay. <laughs> excellent question so yeah really good question so yes you are totally correct plasma is gas that has gotten really really hot and it's so hot that those individual electrons have flown off the nuclei of the atom and they're all flying around independently in the core of a neutron star it is actually far hotter and denser than that. And so it's not just that the electrons, the like silver balloons that Michael was showing, yeah, have like, have detached and are floating around on their own. The actual nucleus of the atom itself is like getting crushed and smushed together with other nuclei. It is like an environment that is denser than the nucleus of an atom. It is a crazy exotic environment that we don't see anywhere else. So, oh, Cameron's got a diagram going. So yeah, it's like a full other state of matter that we don't actually know a ton about other than it must be really cool because it's denser than an atom. So I'm just going to tag on to exactly what Dee was saying with a nice crummy illustration, which is what I'm good at. It causes people to walk out. Um, so here, you've got your atom. Uh, I guess in this case, it's boron. Uh, boron 10, because there's five protons in red and five, uh, five neutrons in black. I don't even think that's a stable isotope. Anyway, um, so there's boron in the nucleus, and then you've got your electrons. Evidently, this is an ion, because there's only four electrons. Uh, but regardless, um, so you're absolutely right. In a plasma, like in the core of a star, you're stripping off all these electrons, and they're flying everywhere. But that nucleus stays intact in the core of a star. It's not that hot. But as Dee correctly pointed out, 
when you're in these super, super, super hot environments, like in a neutron star, it breaks apart this entirely. And then you just have protons and neutrons flying around, or the protons merge with the electrons to form a neutron. And then you've just got a bunch of neutrons, which is why it's called a neutron star. So yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add, but you did an excellent job D uh, Yeah, diagrams there. It's yeah, it's, it's yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or else we'd call it an iron star, which would be pretty cool. I'm sure it gets sponsored by like triathlon, iron star, iron man. Yep. I have a follow up question on one of the earlier questions about the two conditions where you have a sharp transition versus not very sharp. Um, so the example that you mentioned was um, something like if you have five, there was a simulation of 5.1 masses and then something else that's very close, then when you do the simulation, they're very different in terms of how they evolve. So my question is, uh, this seems to be like sensitivity to initial conditions. So is it that the system is inherently um, probabilistic and that's why we're seeing these different evolutions? or that the system is deterministic, but it's a chaotic system, and that's why you see like this sensitivity to initial conditions. Thank you. I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> I didn't want to bring it up, but now that you bring it up. Wonderful, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have, we have a star it has a certain, there's dense stuff in the middle and there's fluffy stuff on the outside. And there's some kind of transition. And the question is, if I have the same transition every single time, am I gonna get the same outcome every single time? Can I determine what's going to happen at the end? And we were talking about this at a research meeting on Wednesday. So we're still, we're st we're st people are still figuring, we're scratching our heads. Unsolved. It's an unsolved question. But what I can tell you is that transition isn't the only piece of the pie. There are other factors that determine whether a star blows up or not. I just wanted to talk about one of the more important ones. Um, dependent, you know, if I have two identical stars and, you know, they both have a, you know, it's very dark in the center, it's very fluffy on the outside, they both might not necessarily blow up. But one thing that can help this thing explode is how much fluid activity there is. So we looked at this picture of this star and we don't want to talk about linear algebra. Whoa, so yeah. <laughs> we, we, have can this, we can erase it. We, we have this star and there's this core and it's a very <laughs> steep transition. People didn't realize they were coming in for college credit here, people. <laughs> you all get your transcripts on the way out. <laughs> This is a lecture hall that gets used for coursework, not just public education. <laughs> okay, so if I have two stars, say they're exactly the same, but one has a lot more fluid activity swirling around like those videos that we saw, and one maybe has a little bit, but there's not a whole lot going on this one's going to be more likely to explode because there's more energy pent up in this fluid. It's moving around, it's spinning a lot more, and effectively what you're doing is you're taking the energy from all that swirling fluid and you're putting it somewhere. You're putting it on the central newly born neutron star. Wonderful. Absolutely. No, this is, this is a discussion. Yeah. Massive stars sometimes have partners or companions. They may be in a binary system. And so a lot of stars have these companions and these can influence one another because gravity acts over a distance. It's what keeps the moon swinging around the earth, but the moon's pulling on the, on the earth and making our tides slosh around. And that happens at a distance. And so if I have two stars and one's pulling on the other with the force of gravity, that can also excite some flow. That's one example of why two identical stars may have 
different conditions. And so to get back to your original point, there are certain properties of stars, particularly with the neutrinos, that are inherently chaotic. There was a paper that was published uh, earlier this week about someone talking about these neutrinos, they can oscillate and they can change their properties, and this is an inherently chaotic process. Now, that doesn't mean all hope is lost. The field of supernova research tells us what are the most important features that influences whether a star blows up or not. We haven't 100% solved the problem yet. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing investigation. So to answer your question, there's going to be a distribution. You're going to have a given star, and there's probably a, you know, a variety of outcomes, but we can tell you know, what's probably going to happen. I have a couple questions from the online audience. Don't worry, we're going to get to everybody in person. But um, one of the questions was, how do isotopes of, any, of elements turn into a new element altogether uh, if the R process is is so is occurring so rapidly right like is there still electron decay where you fling off you pop your silver balloon and and fling away an electron and convert it to uh convert that that neutron to a proton does that still occur even if if i'm over here flinging flinging uh, neutrons at you ah oh that one's <laughs> Yeah, so is there a case of too many, you know, is there a case of too many neutrons? Can these electrons still get spit out? And so when you're thinking about elements, you know, Cameron has his, Cameron has the, nucle the nucleus that's drawn there. A nucleus can only hold so many protons and neutrons for a given element. Beyond this, if you can't hold any more neutrons, you call this the neutron drip line. You know, you throw a neutron in and it just drips out. This has to do with something called the strong force. It holds nuclei together. Um, when you get to a point where there's so many neutrons in a system, it's not going to stick anymore. You need more protons to kind of balance it out and hold it together. So once you get to the point where the neutrons are dripping out of the nucleus, that gives the element time to get rid of another electron and change, uh, change the number of protons that it has. So it depends. If you have too many, then that lets the element catch up and spit out some of those electrons. Okay, great. That was great. Uh, yes. Don't worry. I'll get to the back. Um, less technical. Um, so you study supernova. And um, you, you talked about neutrinos and gravitational waves. Those are observational data that you're using to do your research. Um, vers you know, observational versus theoretical. What what percentage are you using to you know drive your research and, and is it changing yeah what percentage of my research is theoretical versus observational um if you asked me 10 years ago i was living in south america and i was staring at through telescopes so I observations all the way um and then i wanted to try something new and now my day-to-day -day is probably 95 percent theory so I work on these computers. I run these what-if scenarios on the computer. We call them simulations. And the idea, though, is the vital thing for someone who works on theory is whatever you're working on, you want to make sure you can tie it to something that you can measure. So for example, I looked at these gravitational waves. We've never detected one from a supernova. We're waiting for one to go off in our Milky Way. But what the purpose of my research is is that it, when one finally goes off, we want to be able to extract as much information as we can with something that we can see. So when I'm working on my research, I'm constantly talking with people who work at those observatories, those big concrete tubes, to say, what are the things that you can see and how can I support you? And so the feedback I've gotten is, hey, we need to learn new things about the star before it falls in. And so I go back to my computer and I figure out, okay, how can I use a signal about something blowing up to learn about where it started, about its initial conditions. Um, so day to day, now it's 95% theory. So, talk about the one visually observable supernova that we've, we've uh, what, 1054 or something like that? Um, with telescopes and different tools, are we seeing supernova um, in much greater numbers now in the last 200 years or whatever? Yes, 
We see a lot more. Uh, because back then, a thousand years ago, we were only sensitive to the telescope, or to the, that was before the invention of the telescope. So you were only sensitive to seeing a supernova if it was super close and you could see it with your eyes. Then, you know, 500 years ago, 400 years ago, the telescope was invented that allowed, allowed you to probe a larger volume of space because you could see stuff that was fainter. But really in the last like 20 to 25 years, has it improved uh, dramatically with, with automated telescopes that are constantly scanning the sky every night, looking, looking at various places. So one of those major surveys is called the ZTF survey run out of Caltech, the Zwicky Transient Facility. Um, and this uses the Palomar telescope outside of San Diego, one of the largest telescopes um, in the world, to, to scan the, actually it's not using the 200 inch, it's using the 100 inch or the 60 inch. Okay, well, forget what I said. It's a big telescope. It's like, you know, yay big, but um, it's scanning the sky and it covers, I think it covers the whole sky every few days or few nights of scanning. And so it's sensitive to detecting supernova, not just with that are nearby, not even that are just within our galaxy, but in distant galaxies across the sky. And yeah, the chance that there's a supernova happening within our own Milky Way is about once every hundred years that there's one that happens. And we're, by the way, we're overdue. Um, but not, not in a bad way, <laughs> not like the big earthquake that's gonna be bad, but, um, but in a way that it'll be very exciting that we hope that there's a not too close supernova. Actually, there was a web comic about this a few days ago that astronomers are, there's, there's a, I'm not gonna, I'll just, free, uh, anyway, uh, it's XKCD, it's XKCD. But uh, the point is that now we're sensitive because we're looking at, you know, millions of different galaxies that we're seeing the rare events that occur in those galaxies and so we i forget how many how many supernovae are detected every year it's like thousands tens of thousands i think now because we're sensitive to a much larger volume of of space where these things are happening and if i can add on to that astronomy as a hobby has actually helped detections of supernovae so earlier this year supernovae called 2023 ixf we just throw letters after it to label it um this was first caught by an amateur astronomer in Japan who had their setup. They have their own observatory in their backyard, and this is they're just chilling. This is their hobby, and they have a telescope up there, and there's an open system, an alert system that everyone can log on to, and they say, hey, this guy said, hey, I saw something in my backyard. You might want to look over here, and that let us see one of the closest um, supernovae in a long time. It's in the pinwheel galaxy. I think it's called M101. Um, an amateur astronomer first caught it and said, hey, I found it first, and everyone else with their big clunky telescopes finally caught up with them. So, you know, there are automated things, but it growing as a hobby has ab absolutely helped the field. So, it, you know, we, we help each other out hand in hand. So it's, it's wonderful. By the way, when that happened and you came to one of these events and went over there, you could actually see it with our telescopes. So you should come to more of these. Yeah. <laughs> Um, before I get to any more questions, one quick brief announcement. It is 925 right now. They're going to shut down the telescopes at 945. If you haven't been out to see the telescopes and you want to, now is the time. The lines will be, will be short. I don't mean to drive everyone away. I just don't want people to miss their opportunity to look through the telescopes if they came, if that's what they came for. I've got to go to the back because I've been doing all the questions from the front, but I will get, I will get back to the questions in the front, but in the very back, I'll get to you next. In the very, very back, you've been waiting very patiently. Sorry, I don't mean to make you run all the way over here. <laughs> um, so actually, I got a question for all four of you guys, and um, well, perhaps you guys can help me out. It's a multi-part question. Um, so um, if you guys can explain it to like in the simplest of the ways that you can, um, a relay an understanding of, um, you know, knowledge regarding uh, like dark matter and energy and, you know, the smaller stuff like quarks and muons and of the sort. And, um, and for our presenter, um, what is the average, you know, age or distance of supernovae and where are they usually found? Um, but yeah, that's pretty much that sums up my question. We could, we could take up the next hour with all of this, but we'll, we'll try and do a brief thing. So it was... The nature of dark matter, the nature of dark energy, the nature of quarks, <laughs> and then where are the nearest, where are the typical supernovae occurring and what are their ages? Where are supernovae usually located? 
Okay, sure. That's one we can. That's one we can deal with. That's that's tractable. Okay. Sure. Okay. I guess we'll start with dark matter very fast. So basically, dark matter is stuff we don't understand what it is, and it interacts with normal matter. So the stuff that like you or I are made of through gravity. So it can pull on normal matter gravitationally. It can not really push, but pull on normal matter gravitationally. Um, and that is basically the only interaction it has with normal matter. Like you can't light it up. It doesn't emit any sort of electromagnetic field, um, nothing else. And that's actually like very constraining because basically all matter that we know of should do one of those things. So basically dark matter is something we understand through the things we don't understand about it, through the things it can't do. Um, but it really affects how the universe evolves. You want to do it? Yeah. Sure. So dark energy. I kind of don't like how we have these two words, dark matter and dark energy, which kind of sound like, you know, the dark versions of normal matter, normal energy. They're not related at all, unfortunately. Uh, you know, it's kind of weird terminology. Dark energy is basically the word that we use to describe, like, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Right. So that's, you know, the universe expands. Um, so that that in and of itself is kind of an interesting fact. And actually, the one of the big ways that we know that it expands is because we measure supernovae in other galaxies, because we can measure them from very far away. Um, um, but one of the very surprising things, which is what what is called dark energy, is the fact that not only is it expanding, but it actually speeds up over time. So uh, I think the the usual sort of analogy for why this might be surprising uh, is if like I threw a ball in the air, it's like, okay, well, it's going up right now, fine. Uh, but it would be surprising if it kept going up, right? Um, it's surprising because like, you know, you have, if, if you just sort of, you know, uh, crunch out the math of, uh, you know, relativity uh, to try and figure out how the universe should evolve, if you just stick matter, like what we're made of in the universe and, you know, do the math, it turns out the universe expands, but it slows down. Uh, if you fill it with radiation, it slows down. If you fill it with matter and radiation, it also slows down. Uh, and if you put curvature in it, I think it also slows down. So somehow you need this like weird kind of energy, which behaves kind of like a substance that has negative pressure, which is very strange. Like we don't really know what that means even. Um, and so because we don't know what that means, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, that's why it's called dark energy. Okay, and there was quarks and gluons? Right. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so in, we, we're, you know, we're like zooming in and Nick, like Nicholas really, he put this really well. Uh, you have to understand the small scale to understand the large things. And so uh, Cameron drew this boron and I'm making a lot of noise. Okay, I'm, we're all made of atoms. So these are very tiny things, they have electrons. But atoms are made of things too, and so if we go into um, if we go into one of these and we do like a nice zoom in, and so we're we're on the inside of this person this thing right now. Um, this is uh, let's say it's a you know a neutron. So inside of this, this has three quarks. So basically, you can think of quarks as the building blocks of particles. They make up things like protons and neutrons. But these quarks on their own, they're, you know, if they weren't interacting, they wouldn't stay together. And so they need something to kind of hold them. They need some way to communicate. And so um, maybe you have heard of something called a photon before. This is an example of light. When you have a charged particle, like an electron, that thing that zaps out of your finger, and it moves, and it curves and, you know, changes direction, it will emit a photon. We'll call it gamma. This is a way that the electron can communicate, it can send information. Instead of a photon, you have a gluon. This is the way that quarks communicate with one another. So it's a way that it's a particle that talks, you know, it's a way for these things to talk to each other. You could think of it like that. They're sending information, they're saying, hey, I'm trying to hold on to you, I'm trying to keep you together. Anything else? Yeah. So one thing that I'll say is there are four fundamental forces in the universe. Um, and Wait, what are they? 
You can't just a, put that out there. I'll just leave that out there for homework. Therefore, but don't worry about it. So there's there's gravity, which we've all heard about, right? There's there's light, right? Uh, sorry, there's electromagnetism, right? And the particle, as uh, Michael was saying, the uh, particle, yeah, is is um is the photon, right? Is the light particle. Now, one of the things about light uh, particles is that even though photons, yeah, they carry electromagnetism, they don't themselves have any electric charge. Another way of saying that is uh, photons don't really hit each other. Photons don't stick together, one, one might say, right? Then there's the weak force, uh, which is basically responsible for a lot of radioactive decay processes. And then there's this force, uh, which is mediated by this weird kind of particle called the gluon. Um, and this force is it's the called strong, the strong force strong because it's force. the strongest one. <laughs> the weak force is actually not the weakest one, by the way. That's gravity, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, Depends so, on your proximity to I'm right. Gonna, yeah, let's not let's yeah. not get into the uh, yeah. Um, so um, the thing about this particular the strong force is ve a very complicated theory. You know, so mathematically, in some ways, the strong forces theory kind of, which is called cr quantum chromodynamics, is very similar to quantum electrodynamics, but because of, you know, something which will make, a word which will make physicists scream, which is nonlinearity, it's the difference between being able to, like, write this theory down and predict things to, like, dozens of significant, dozens of digits, and, like, knowing things to, like, 30% or something like that. Uh, things like quarks are super complicated objects. Uh, it's usually described that they have three, uh, sorry, it's usually described that things like protons have three quarks in them. But in reality, it's sort of, you should think of it as like a super complicated, like boiling pot. And like each individual nucleon, like a proton or a neutron, has like thousands and thousands of uh, sort of virtual quarks popping in and out of existence at all po points in time. It just so happens if you cancel all of them out, that you're just left with these. Um, and it turns out that if you add up like three quarks mass together, that's only like a very small fraction of the mass of this kind of particle. They're super complicated objects. Um, I won't go so much more into it, but it's um, a, a very interesting, complicated thing that we don't understand particularly well, I think. So that summarizes all of modern physics. <laughs> oh, the last question was, where do supernovae tend to occur? Um, there are two primary... I shouldn't talk about it. You're the supernova king. Do you want to talk about oh, this? No, I, never, I didn't give myself that name. Uh, so the, okay. in 1987, a supernova went off in one of the Magellanic, large Magellanic Cloud, yeah. so, which is a, this is a galaxy, a, cl a clump of stars and gas outside of our Milky Way. And this is around... Uh, 50 kiloparsecs, it's a unit of distance. I can't translate kiloparsecs to miles off the top of my head. But um, it's a ways away. It's pretty it's a it's a stone's throw away. Yeah. Um, there are things like the crab and uh, Cassiopeia A, I think those are order like ten times closer. And Betelgeuse is like half a kiloparsec, so that's like, you know, even closer than that. Um, but in terms of where supernovae tend to occur, there are certain groups of stars or certain kinds of galaxies where um, they're a little bit more favorable. Pass it over. So, yeah, basically, in order for a supernova to tend to occur, you need the stars that are going to make a supernova. So you need massive stars, uh, and those tend to kind of live fast, die young. Uh, and so you need, on cosmic scales, stars that have recently been formed on cosmic scales. This is still like hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so basically supernovae tend to occur in galaxies where stars are being formed actively. Um, and so that's, they tend to be younger galaxies. They tend to be galaxies with a lot of the type of gas I study. Um, that sort of thing is where you're going to see them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Case closed. We solved all the problems. So um, we've got a few minutes left. Get the, don't worry, I'll, I'll get back to everybody, everybody. So this is now going back in context to when we were talking about stars that are more or less likely to supernova. Um, so I've been reading that there's a finding recently that the sun is actually shrinking by, I guess it's a few hundred miles a year, it's a relatively small amount, and they think that it might be an oscillation rather than a one directional shrink, if that's, I think that's correct. I know. Betelgeuse is pretty unstable and seems to be changing in size. Um, 
so do we think that on a dynamic basis, those are the forces that contribute to the sort of tipping point of when, when the star, or do, because the, the diagram that you showed originally was more of a static diagram. And so that's what I was wondering if, if we sort of play the video of this, is this something where the, the dynamic forces are what's causing it? So I haven't heard of this uh, sun thing actually, which is kind of interesting. The sun does oscillate actually. Um, uh, it turns out that there is basically uh, the outer layers of the, the sun sort of like do something called convection. So they kind of like bubble and shake the star like that. Uh, the sun is not an example of a star which will explode actually. Um, it, it turns out what will happen is that it will run out of hydrogen in its core. It will start, eventually it will start burning helium. And then it sort of sloughs out its outer layers and you're going to end up with like a, a like sort of very compact ball of uh, basically carbon and oxygen atoms. Um, yeah, any, let's see. After toasting all of us. Right, yeah, yeah, definitely. And so you also asked about uh, does this, does, do these events on the outside of the star have an influence? Can that tip the scale and cause it to fall in? Um, so largely what's, what's going to influence what, what really sends it over the edge is there's this, so we have this hunk of iron in the center and outside we have a layer of silicon. And this silicon is fusing, it's making, it's making heavier and heavier elements. And so really it's, you know, it's kind of like you're putting weights on the scale and you keep putting more weights on the scale and silicon is just dumping more iron, it's dumping more iron. So really that silicon layer is what's going to end up tipping the scale. What's happening on the outer edges, that's kind of its own thing at this point. Um, that's not going to affect dynamically what causes the initial collapse to happen. But you can have these, uh, you can have these outer layers of hydrogen fusing that cause this star to actually pulse. It can cause it to slosh off material. It can actually dredge up material as well. But to answer your question, that silicon layer is what's important for really making it heavier in the center. Okay. I'm staying back here where all the questions are. Hey, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, and questions and answers. So uh, how fast the gravitational wave can travel uh, after the supernova and how long the space distortion uh, lasts after that? How quickly do the gravita gravitational waves travel and how long do they stay present? You want to do it? How fast do they travel? It turns out, and I don't think this is particularly obvious, they travel at the speed of light, um, like exactly at the speed of light. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, answer to the answer to that question. Um, in terms, How do we know? Uh, that's a good question. I don't actually know that. that. I do. Oh. <laughs> so we, it's, it, it isn't obvious how we would know this, and people didn't know this until the event that Michael was referring to before in 2017. So in that event, there were two neutron stars that merged together, and in doing so, we were able to detect the gravitational waves signature from that merger. But it turns out that unlike two black holes that merge, when two black holes that merge, you don't see anything that happens visually because there's no electromagnetic counterpart. But with two neutron stars that merge, you do see an electromagnetic, there is like a, a flash of sorts. And this was detected and something, I forget the statistics, but something like a third of all the teles research telescopes in the world, everyone knew because LIGO put out an announcement that we detected things, point your telescope there. And so everyone's like, oh, ah, da, da. but all these astronomers who are working on it couldn't talk about it. It was all embargoed. I wasn't on the inside track. I was like, I, I didn't know because it was during, it was in the week leading up to the, the solar eclipse that happened in 2017. So all these astronomers are trying to go to the eclipse to see it just for fun. Um, and then all these other astronomers are trying to like observe this rare event that's a once in a lifetime kind of event, or at least it was the first in a lifetime kind of event. But the point is from this long ramble is that we were able to detect both the light as well as the gravitational waves at reasonably the same time scale, which told us that the, that the like, the, the travel rate of the gravitational wave front was traveling at basically the same rate as the speed of light from this distant object. And so to closer than one part in like a billion, they are the same speed, at least has been detected. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's good. That's great. 
Um, the second question was like, how long does it take for the space time to sort of come back, right? Um, so in terms of like, how long does it take to sort of stop wiggling so that we don't see that anymore? That's that's pretty fast. You know, that's sort of like the time scale of the merger, which is very very quick. Um, but it turns out, and we have a uh, a colleague on the third floor who doesn't let us forget this, Keith Mittman, who uh, loves to tell us that in these sorts of events, it turns out that the space time actually doesn't go back to where it started. And th this is an effect called gravitational memory, which is still uh, under active research and uh, could be detectable. I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, okay. Sorry, guys. I've got to keep going from the back. I'm going to ban any more multi-part questions, though. I'll tell you that. that they take oh. too long. Um, is there a preferred type of neutrinos to be detected? Like, like, Are there preferred types of neutrinos to be detected? So neutrinos come in three flavors. There are electron type, there are mu type, and there are tau type. These are ways um, they have different properties. and depending on your detector, you can be sensitive to different ones. So the ones that we, that I alluded to, Super Kamiokande and Dune, the, the ones that look like supervillain layers, those are sensitive to electron type antineutrinos and for Super K and electron type neutrinos for Dune. I believe I got that, that um, correct. And in terms that we think there's going to be mostly these kinds of neutrinos emitted during supernovae, um, there's still a huge area of particle physics because the kind of like spinning a roulette wheel um, neutrinos can change their flavors and so it might lead as an electron and it'll fly throughout space and it'll change it'll change and then it'll hit our detectors we've measured these discrepancies with neutrinos from the sun actually using that kamiokande detector um, and so to answer your question yes there are uh, we are sensitive to certain types of neutrinos over others can i ask one more neutrino related question uh okay. <laughs> so, um, neutrinos travels at near the speed of light, right? Uh, so, this, uh, so special relativity plays a major role in their whatever. And uh, does, uh, does this affect how we detect them? And how, if so, how do we account for that effect? Yeah, so does special relativity matter? So if you haven't heard of special relativity before, um, physics starts to change when you move really, really fast, like near the speed of light. This is the cosmic speed limit. Um, and special relativity describes things that are moving very quickly. Um, so yeah, special relativity absolutely affects them. Um, you know, at their speed to them, their rate of time, their clock is, you know, evolving at one rate compared to ours, it's going to be a lot different. So it does absolutely have an effect on, um, on how they evolve. Sorry, there was one more question from the online audience. Oh, do the gradation waves in the so Chris Mack from YouTube asks do the gradation waves that you describe that are traveling and you kind of showed some of the visualizations within the the star do they travel faster than light no because nothing travels faster than light but they are I guess it's a fluid so they're traveling at less than the speed of sound in that fluid which is much less than the speed of light for these sorts of objects right okay um okay sorry we just had to get to that i didn't want to keep that person hanging uh, so um i guess it's not clear to me if you're able to well so like the hobbyist was looking and saw a supernovae right you're not able to detect them before they happen so that you can then focus in a certain place in the sky to capture the whole event essentially as it starts. So that's one question. Um, the other is the 1970, 1987 supernovae. I guess um, I was listening to Sean Carroll's recent podcast and they were talking about how it was so exciting that there was like a dozen neutrinos that hit 
and I'm so just kind of curious of why that's so exciting and significant. Last question, if, if, if you can get to, this is off topic, this is very off topic, but if you could sim, if you could in a simple way explain what it means for space to be flat in like a geometric sense, because I know it's not like flat, like a flat earth, right? Like flat earth. <laughs> I'm obligated to say the Earth is not flat. Yeah. But what was the first one? I don't, what was the first one? You get oh, all these multi-part questions. I, you're, you're, I, 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 I don't quite understand whether you're actually seeing these events, you know, from you know time zero right. as they happen, or you're able to pre-detect them because you you know you're you're only seeing things as fast as light comes at you, right? So what is is there a pre-detect event so that you can see them happen? Oh, so do we have an indicator that, that tells us there's going to be a supernova that occurs? Not yet. Not yet. I mean, well, here, you tell me. You're the, you're uh, the guy doing the simulation. So it depends. So once the supernova goes off, so the thing falls in and the, the shock wave goes out, we get, so the gravitational waves and the neutrinos are emitted. Those take a finite amount of time. You know, if you're, if you're going on a road trip, your car moves so fast, and it's going to take a certain amount of time to go from point A to point B. So once the supernova goes off, the distance from, you know, the time it takes from the supernova to Earth, the speed of light, that's, as, that's the soonest we can get it for when the supernova goes off. But there's active areas of research looking for pre-supernova warning signs. And so there are, these, there are these shells of material that are very hot, and those can emit neutrinos that are detectable by our detectors. So there are some scientists claiming, okay, if they're in the very, very late stages of the star before it goes supernova, it should be emitting detectable neutrinos. And so they're trying to use those as warning signs for other things. Now, the problem is supernova are not the only thing that emit neutrinos. And so our detectors get neutrinos from everything. So the, the, the caveat is you need to come up with a smoking gun. You need definitive answers of, well, how do I know for sure these neutrinos are from supernovae versus something else. So people are coming up with ideas to do that, but to, to untangle it in terms of other things, that still is an active area research. Oh, the neutrinos that were detected. It was, uh, the, the reason that was so exciting is that was the first time we'd had what's known as multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, throughout all of history of astronomy, we've only been able to figure out what's going, around, going on in the sky based on light that's come to these distant objects, and we've detected it with our eyes or maybe our telescopes. This is the first time we got something other than a light ray that told us what was going on in the universe. And in, in this case, it was in the form of neutrinos, these particles that were traveling to us, not light rays. And then... To, not electro yeah not electromagnetic yeah because electromagnetic radiation is you know photons it's light it's optical it's visible light it's x-rays it's all these but it's all the same type of thing it's a photon whereas these were particles that were traveling to us and now with gravitational wave astronomy that's another messenger it's another uh medium through which information is is being transported from these distant objects to us so that's that's kind of people refer to this as the era of multi-messenger astronomy and that was basically the first indication of that and then the third question Just, if you, if you can explain what it means for space to be flat oh why is Infinite. why is what's that what's it mean to have space be flat so uh for yeah it's not a two-dimensional structure. Uh, the idea of flatness is simply, um, if you think about a, a Euclidean geometry is the technical term. That's where, that's the geometry that we all learned in ninth grade or whatever class you took when you're dealing with triangles and polygons and all these sorts of things. Um, but when you are on, that works, everything works where like the three angles inside of a triangle add up to 180 degrees in Euclidean geometry because it's flat. But when you're on the surface of a sphere and you draw, oh, wait, oh I do have a pen. If you now draw a triangle, I'll use not red on orange, um, and you draw a triangle here, you can draw, uh, that's not the best one, I'll do it, give me another, ah, oh my gosh, oh, this is wild, um, you can draw a triangle that has three right angles in it. 
90 plus 90 plus 90 equals 270, not 180. That is not a flat geometry. This is, a, this is on a spheroid. And you can come up with different um, systems, whether it's, it's curved like this or it's curved like this or whatever, in which case you get geometries that don't work like that. And that's basically, is the universe in this realm where it's basically flat and, and behaving in a Euclidean geometry or is it some wonky thing? And you wanted to add on this. Sure, yeah. So I think it's easy to like sort of look at this or like sort of think about analogies of the earth and be like, well, it's not really flat, right? Because, you know, you're looking at it like from outside of it and you're like, it's a sphere. Okay, but when we say things like, oh, you know, maybe the universe has some curvature, what we mean is like, if I go and I like, like literally like make a triangle, like where every line is straight in the universe, just like put a triangle on the floor, if I made it big enough, and I measured the angles that we would be able to do something like this, right? Um, so if you're inside this universe, you wouldn't be able to see out, you know, sort of step out of it and be like, yeah, that's, that's spherical, or, you know, it's obviously not really straight you know you wouldn't be able to tell um okay we have like seven minutes left i am putting a veto on all multi-part questions no more uh we have there's still so many questions to ask here here how does a star that goes supernova become a black hole how does a star that becomes a supernova go be, you know become a black hole so when supernovae collapse, they're going to have that neutron, many of them will have that neutron star for a certain period of time. And those neutrons are pushing and they're supporting and they're holding all that material up on top of it. But if enough material dumps onto it, if that shock that was pushed out falls back and fails, well, now the neutrons can't hold it up anymore and it collapses even further. So if that shock wave doesn't make it to the outside of the star and it comes back in, there's going to be too much mass for it to handle and it's going to collapse under its own weight. So it's a matter of how much stuff does it accumulate. I'll be the runner. <laughs> okay. Who's next? Uh, I don't think someone back there asked yet. Thank you very much. Of course. I, I, know this is, I know this is broad and we have time constraints, but there, we have you know, galaxy people in the room. Um, I, I, I listened to a podcast recently that discussed uh, uh, web findings where we're seeing uh, galaxies that are more mature, more numerous than were expected towards the edge of the observable universe. Um, again, I know this is broad, but can you, can you discuss uh, some of those implications, uh, you know, causes or, or what it could mean for when we're talking about uh, galaxy formation processes or, or black holes or, or out of the, the rate of expansion of the universe. And thank you. Yeah, totally. So just for some context, we have a pretty good idea of how old the universe is from sort of the, the studies we were discussing earlier. So we have a pretty good idea the Earth is 13.8 billion years old, not the Earth, the universe. Um, and so that means that when we are looking um, at very early galaxies, we basically know how much time they have had to evolve to get to their point, that point. And we also, from like the sort of simulations that Cameron does, we know sort of how long it takes a galaxy to evolve. So most of the universe started as just sort of loose hydrogen gas, and that like slowly collapsed in on itself to make stars and then eventually galaxies. That is a very slow process. We need to go from individual hydrogen atoms to like these very complex, very large things full of things like stars that could go supernova. Um, and that, that takes ages. And so what is happening right now is the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared space telescope, which means it can see light that has been redshifted a lot, light that basically is very early um, in the sort of history of the universe. And so it is our first chance to easily look back into the history of the universe and see galaxies from that time. And as we are doing that, we are seeing that some of these galaxies look far more mature than we think they should. Um, they seemed to like be like further along in their process of becoming a galaxy than maybe they should be. Uh, so, Huge caveat to all that is James Webb has only been on the sky for a few years um, and science takes time. It takes time to really understand things. So part of it might be that, you know, we just haven't had time to fully digest what's going on. 
Um, so there might be like still some observational stuff we haven't figured out. Um, assuming there is not, which like it's seeming more and more like there might not be, um, we might have to revise some of our understanding of like, in particular, how like baryonic matter. So like the type of matter that human beings are made of, the type of matter that does complicated things like chemistry, like all of the stuff we've just been talking about, basically, like that stuff is actually much harder to understand and to predict than things like dark matter, actually, because dark matter, we know exactly what it does and what it does is very simple. Baryonic matter, less so. So maybe there's some weird stuff like that happening um, to make these galaxies the way they are. Uh, finally, also, there's this thing called um, selection bias in astronomy, where that stuff, you know, everything, yeah, but uh, in astronomy in particular, or completeness bias, um, it's the context where we're looking like really, really, really far away to see these objects. And so that light has had to travel a really, really long time to get to us and a really, really long distance to get to us. And earlier we were saying like, if light travels four times as far, um, it could get 16 times as faint. So we are only seeing the, the very, very brightest objects from this time. And so it might be that we're just seeing like really special objects and we don't have a good idea of like the entire population of galaxies that are happening right there. So that those are all possible explanations. There is also always the glaring explanation that like our understanding of the universe is wrong, but I wouldn't quite jump to that quite yet. Did you have anything to add? No. I was answering a question online. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. Well, you haven't find, you've been waiting for like three hours here. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. It, do we know if our sun has a gradient like you just discussed before and what type of gradient that might be? A density gradient in the interior of the sun? Our sun is, uh, you know, in some sense, it's pretty young. It's still burning hydrogen, and so it's on what's called the main sequence of stars, which most stars are. Um, and these stars are typically don't have very strong um, density gradients. Like the density does change, um, but not like like very suddenly. Yeah. How many people didn't get all their questions asked? Is there, are there any? Well, you already asked a you asked a multi-part question for goodness sake you didn't it is 10 o'clock now uh for those of you who didn't get your question asked you can come up and ask at least me i can't stay i can't make these people stick around but you can ask me uh thank you all for sticking around thanks thanks to our speaker and our panel tonight i think they all did a really good job um Thank you guys for sticking around. Hope you, hopefully you got some decent views through the telescopes. Again, our next events coming up will be January 29th, Monday, our next Astronomy on Tap, about taking pictures of exoplanets, um, as well as legends and myths of the night sky from different cultures, and astronomy-themed pub trivia and live music and such. And our next stargazing lecture like this will be just after Valentine's Day, that, that Friday, and it'll be on the topic of solar physics, what's going on in the sun, as well as a little uh, tidbit about the upcoming solar eclipse. So thank you for joining us. We'll see you guys next month. Thank you for coming here.